Welcome back to Butler on Business. My name is Alan Butler. Jason, would you please introduce Sheldon Richmond to the audience? Absolutely. We're going to be talking about the IMF, and we're joined on the phone now by Sheldon Richmond, who is the editor of The Freeman. It's a publication that's put out by the Foundation for Economic Education. He also, he also serves as a senior fellow for the Future of Freedom Foundation. How are you doing today, Sheldon? Doing fine. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's certainly a pleasure to talk to you. I've been a longtime follower of your writing, so I'm happy to be able to finally to speak with you. But I wanted to start out asking just what is the International Monetary Fund? What is the IMF? That's, that's something that I don't think a lot of people even know what this agency is designed to do. Well, the IMF was set up uh, along with the World Bank after World War II uh, in order to um, coordinate the various countries of the world's uh, central banking policies uh, because um, when, when the, the world came out of the war, uh, the, the prevailing powers, the dominant powers, which was the U.S., of course, and uh, Britain to some extent, uh, one that has set up a system of, of uh, fixed exchange rates uh, based on the dollar. In other words, uh, most of the world's currencies would be linked to the dollar, and the dollar at that point was still uh, linked to gold, at least internationally. Americans couldn't turn their dollars in for gold because Roosevelt had uh, stopped that in, in the 30s, and in fact, his first year in office. Uh, but uh, the, world's, the world could still turn in dollars for gold, uh, and, and so a part of the... Uh, so exchange, uh, the, the idea was that everything was going to be fixed to the dollar, and the dollar was fixed to gold. So in a sense, indirectly, the world's currencies were fixed <laughs> to gold. Um, the IMF uh, specific mission was set up to help uh, countries maintain those, uh, uh, you know, that a steady uh, uh, link to the dollar. So uh, it stood ready with uh, with reserves to, to help it out. Uh, so it was part of really a um, a global regime inspired by Keynes. Keynes uh, helped set up uh, the whole Bretton Woods uh, uh, scheme, which included, the, like I said, the IMF, the World Bank, <clears throat> and, uh, and some other things. And uh, the, the idea was really to let the U.S. lead the way, uh, and, uh, and if it wanted to inflate globally, uh, other, na- other uh, currencies wouldn't be able to uh, resist it because they were all, they were all linked to the dollar and, uh, and would remain so. So it was a way of having a global inflation. Uh, and, inflationary policy when uh, when that was believed uh, necessary. Uh, in 1971, uh, Nixon uh, broke the link between gold and the dollar for foreign governments, so they could no longer turn in their their dollars for gold, and uh, uh, that didn't mean so. The, the and we went into, into a system of floating exchange rates at that point. In other words, there was nothing formally holding other currencies to the dollar and indirectly to gold. Uh, that didn't mean the IMF closed shop. You know, given that its mission had just disappeared, it didn't uh, say, "Okay, well, I guess we uh, all close the, all, you know, shutter the office and all go out and find honest work." No, they just found another mission. They were just given another mission, which was dispensing advice and loans to failing uh, uh, governments, governments that couldn't pay their debts. But mainly dictatorships, wasn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, mostly. Well, of course, true. Uh, mostly dictatorships. So, uh, mostly, you know, third world mostly back uh, originally. And, of course, most of the third world uh, at that point, uh, yeah, were, had some kind of authoritarian, if not totalitarian, uh, governments. So they would lend uh, – if a country got in trouble, if a, if a, uh, if a ruler was, uh, got t- into too much debt, mainly to Western banks, Wall Street banks, and, and was going to threaten to default, the IMF would come in with uh, money, which, of course, was taken from taxpayers, American and other Western taxpayers, and bail out the uh, – the, the government, the government that couldn't, uh, that was, you know, too much in hock and couldn't pay uh, and pay its bills. So they, uh, so that they could pay back our New York-based banks. Right. So they could pay back the, the, the New York creditors mostly, uh, maybe other Western creditors, and also dispense advice on what they should do. Uh, and uh, you know, some of that was sort of market-oriented at times. Other times it wasn't. Like they very uh, one of their most popular pieces of advice to a, to a government that was in trouble was to raise taxes. Uh, so, uh, you know, who were they raising taxes on? Mostly <laughs> poor poor people who couldn't uh, stand it, who weren't responsible for the policies, who were uh, living under authoritarianism or worse anyway. And but the IMF, uh, that was one of its most popular pieces of advice, was to ra- raise taxes. Uh, they would do other things too. They would uh, tell them to take price controls off of food, but they wouldn't. T- they basically, you know, all the other privileges remained uh, in place to, on, you know, who could sell food, who could grow food, 
et cetera, all the privileges, the franchises, the patents, and all that stuff. So just to lift price controls, while well, that's in a vacuum, that sounds like a pro-market uh, um, move. If everything else is in place, if the whole theory, the whole uh, structure of, uh, of neo, you know, semi-feudalism and, uh, and uh, corporatism and government intervention is, is still in place, all you do when you lift price controls is really stick it to just average common people. And they, they came to hate the market because they thought that meant they thought that was a pro-market move to lift price controls when, when you haven't done anything else. So it's given the market a bad name. So it's been bad all around. Sheldon, can we get you to turn down your radio slightly? We're getting a little bit of feedback, uh, I think. I don't, I don't have a radio. <laughs> okay, then it might be the, the acoustics over here. But okay. um, yeah, the, to expand a little bit more on this, what you've written are called a, a basically a double bailout. First, the politicians, they they bail out the the bankers and the the failing creditors but i mean who who actually is paying for these bailouts it's it's not only our citizens who are funding the money but it's also the citizens of these impoverished countries right well you know the the money that uh, the IMF lends they call them like special drawing rights they have some kind of special uh, uh paper currency but the but the uh, the taxpayers of the west uh, Provided and 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 it's a, there's a weighted contribution by each country. There's like 187 countries uh, in the in the in the game, and uh, the U.S. Uh, pays about 17 percent of the total. Right now, the uh, IMF has on hand like 340 billion dollars. So the Americans put in 17 percent of that, and uh, you know we get a weighted vote. So we get a uh, you know a vote of about uh, well, it's not quite. 17 percent is over. It's like 16 point something percent of the vote. So we put in the most, and you know supposedly we have these votes. But who's casting the who's casting the votes? Well, the, uh, the, our representative on the on the uh, board of governors is the Treasury Secretary, and the uh, associate uh, governor, I guess, head of the Fed. So <laughs> these are not exactly free market people uh, who are guiding, helping to guide, and have the bulk of the votes on the, on the IMF. So. Uh, it's ta- it's American and uh, and other taxpayer money that goes to a failing uh, government, a government that's uh, you know gotten trouble. Uh, so the, the the reason I called it a dual bailout is on the, fr- on, the on the one hand the, uh, the the ruling government, the government that's getting the bailout is um, is is uh, is being helped because it's being shielded from the consequences of its ridiculous policies. Instead of just being failed and maybe driven out of power by by people like uh, happened in Egypt. Or, uh, they, they get a cushion. They get, they get all they get all this money from the IMF, and uh, they can uh, undo or not undo, but cushion some of the consequences of their own failed policies. So it's it's a bailout for failed policies and failed rulers, and that, you know that's known as moral hazard. If, if people know they're going to get bailed out, then they're more reckless than they would be if they didn't uh, if they didn't think they were getting bailed out. The other bailout is like I say for the creditors, namely the Western banks, the American banks that have lent money to these dictators, and they le- they lend to the extent that they do at all because they know there's an IMF to help them out. I mean, they they also realize the Fed and, uh, and other agencies will help them out if they're if they're in big trouble. But the first line of defense for them is the IMF. So they lend certainly lend more than they might otherwise uh, because the IMF uh, its announced purpose is to do just that to bail them out when they are afraid they're not going to get their loans repaid. Uh, Another group that likes uh, to increase the, con- the U.S. contribution to the IMF are exporters, like agriculture exporters and, uh, and other exporters, because they figure if money is going to a, a third-world country, they'll be able to buy more American exports. And uh, a couple of years ago in Congress to increase the U.S. contribution, which I, uh, I think prevailed, uh, you know, the, the Agriculture Department and the farmers were in there lobbying for an increased contribution to the IMF, for the very reason that they thought this would mean this would aid the export-led recovery of the U.S. economy, because well, if, if you give money to far, I mean, here's the, the logic: give the American taxpayers money to foreign governments, and that way they'll buy more American exports, and somehow that's good for the American economy. Well, there's there's absolutely no doubt that the IMF has done a lot to politicize the the giving of, of foreign aid. Would would the developing countries themselves do you think that they would be better off without an IMF? Oh sure, because like I say, you wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't have a safety net for uh, dictators and other uh, you know forms of government that uh, that that get deep into debt. And uh, at least the troubles 
uh, when they got into economic trouble, the people would, uh, w- wouldn't be fooled into thinking, well, don't worry, an international agency is coming to, to rescue us. They might uh, toss out. Uh, a, uh, you know, Mubarak uh, sooner if they didn't have the IMF uh, cushioning the country from the uh, you know the worst consequences of uh, of their bad uh, policy. So yeah, they would definitely be better off. The other thing is it's discrediting market rhetoric because they put the the so-called reforms in mar- in market terms, pro market terms, and then the people suffer and then they come to hate the market for it. I mean, this has been reported about Egypt uh, in uh, during uh, Sadat's uh, 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 Anwar Sadat's uh, um, regime, which was Mubarak's predecessor, uh, un- under uh, advice from either the World Bank or the IMF, and it, you know, it doesn't matter much. They ought to, they need to both go. Mubarak lifted price controls on food, but did nothing else. So food prices skyrocketed, and there were food riots, and. This left a bad taste in people's mouths, and they associate that with market reforms. And today, pro-market reformers are distrusted in, in Egypt. And so the IMF and the uh, World Bank, uh, are, whether they intend it or not, are working against the radical market reform that these countries need. And so it's, uh, you know, no libertarian should be uh, in favor of these things. Well, we certainly appreciate your time today. I think the IMF is an agency that more people need to become familiar with, at least understand how it operates, what its missions are, and what the real implications of its actions have been. You can find more of Sheldon Richmond's writings at the Freeman online. Again, that's a publication put out by the Foundation for Economic Education. Sheldon, one last question before yeah. we have to let you go. The, okay. the future of Freedom Foundation, I'm not as familiar with that. What do you guys do over there? Well, it's similar. We're promoting um, free markets, and then there's a lot of emphasis on foreign affairs and civil liberties. I mean, FEE is more, uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, as the name implies, is more oriented to strictly economic policy. But FFF, under Jacob Hornberger, uh, has a bit broader of an agenda. He uh, spends a lot, we spend a lot of time writing about the wars, the uh, U.S. imperial policies, uh, and the civil liberties violations from things like the Patriot Act. So it's, it's a bit more uh, broader, more broad. Well, great. Well, I certainly appreciate all the work that you do to continue to promote the message of sound economics and also personal liberty. So thank you for your time today. Well, I appreciate your, your having me uh, on your program. Thank you.